Game in the game, and it's Shanklin buying a bit of space. Shanklin! That's what he does! McTominay bounces off the bar, and Shanklin puts away the rebound. Wilson, here's Shanklin, you don't want to give him any space. Lauren Shanklin! It's what he does best! Welcome back to the What The Fork podcast in association with Viper Goalkeeping. Today's guest is currently one of the most lethal goal scorers in British football and a player that has scored close to 100 goals over the past three seasons. Welcome to the show, Lauren Shankland. How are you doing, mate? I'm good, thanks. Thanks for having me on. So I'll kick off with current things. Obviously, we're all going to go through your entire career, but it would be wrong of me to not congratulate you on obviously being officially champions and having gained promotion to the Scottish Premiership. So how are you feeling about it? I were obviously delighted. Our main objective at the start of the season was obviously promotion and that was obviously the, the task for everybody at the club and thankfully enough it has came about and obviously different circumstances and we probably anticipated but at the end of the day it's just good to get the job done and as you said we're in the Premier League now. I mean I think at the time, I could be wrong here but I think it was 14 points clear you were at the time when the season sort of came to a halt. I think it would have been 14 I so we did, we got us in a good position. I mean we had quite a Quite a good gap at the top, and obviously we played Inverness maybe the third last game before, and we managed to beat them as well. So it kind of gave us a lot of breathing space. Yeah, and I think you know it's like no real surprises in a way that there's been no real complaints that you know the league has been um, given to you and you've been granted promotion. I think it's fair to say that unless a catastrophic turn of events had happened, you probably would have won that promotion anyway. But you've been part of sides that have won promotion before. So is it kind of disappointing that you weren't able to sort of celebrate it in the, the normal the normal way you would? Definitely, yeah, because the, the group of boys we had, it was all a tight-knit group. You know I mean, everybody got on really well and there's going to be boys moving on, obviously now at the end of the season. And it's a shame that you can't really get that, that moment together. You can all get in and celebrate because it is a good feeling. And, Titles don't come along that often for most people, so it's it's disappointing to miss out on that. But there's a lot going on now. You know what I mean? The world does more. There's more important things in us to to get and celebrate. So yeah, yeah, absolutely, mate, absolutely. How was it? You did manage to celebrate? Did you have like a celebratory drink via Zoom or something like that? Or we did, we did a Zoom meeting. I when obviously the, the night it got announced, we, we all went online and we did a Zoom meeting, and then just all the boys were just chilling. It was actually all right. It was good. Do you know how when we found out, I think it was April the 14th, obviously we found out through official channels and stuff like that. Was it exactly the same for yourself? Did you not find anything out until it was officially announced? I was just in the, I was sitting in the back garden and then I came in in the group chat and then I seen it on, it'd been announced, so I just seen it on there, but it wasn't, it wasn't the greatest way to find that you'd done a league, you know what I mean, but it's, we'll take it. You deal with it that way in, in a sense, don't you? And I suppose it's like, obviously I'm a Sunderland fan and I remember when Sunderland won the league with Roy Keane. Darren Ward, it was the only title he'd ever won, but Roy Keane was determined not to have an open top bus celebration because he felt Sunderland should be only celebrating things in the Premiership. As it was, Darren Ward never actually got his uh, open top bus celebration, but he's still only 24, so there's time to maybe win a couple more trophies and have a nice open top bus celebration, isn't there? I certainly hope so. Um, that's obviously one of your things in your career. You better go in and, and win trophies and stuff, and I'm fun to know it's good to be a part of that, and hopefully many, many come. Going back to sort of your childhood, we'll go back to as far as we can. Uh, obviously, born in Glasgow, vigorously passionate football city that doesn't really give you a choice to like football or not, if we're honest with each other. But what are your earliest memories of getting into football then? We had a big family background. They all played football, so I just kind of got involved with them in the early days. I was always you know, three, four years older than me, so I was always wanting to get involved in their games. Probably didn't any good to them, but um, no, that was probably it. For then on in, I just loved it and took it on myself to go and kick on. With Glasgow, and I've had Chris Burke on the show as well, who's obviously probably a generation just uh, beyond you as well. He talked about how important street football was for him and the fact that Glasgow enabled him to do that. Do you feel quite privileged you were born in such a, a passionate city that, like I say before, it doesn't really give you the option of you know, liking football or not. You just do. You're just born into that. We grew up and everybody kind of was interested in football around about my bit where I stayed. Um, it was just a big grass field, so everybody just used to meet there, 
everything most nights after school and that and then obviously in the summer holidays we were over there every day so it was just a constant kind of football education as you could call it for we were younger and avoiding getting kicked off the bigger boys who was it that first sort of noticed that you had like a talent for sticking the ball in the onion bag though because I suppose we all want to play football but let's be honest I think from a very young age you were sort of noticed by Queen's Park as it was but who was at that first notice that oh, you know he's not bad him he, he knows where the net is um, I played I played for my, my local team Bearson Juniors um, one of the games um, it was a place Stepford we played and there was Heart Scouts there that was when I was about seven and they used to train at Stepford as well at night time so they kind of started a wee training camp and I think it was after about three to four months and then I got moved through the academy you were eight um Ish when you sort of got picked up by was it? You, did you say your junior school team? No, it was. Um, I played with my boys club team, and then boys Hearts, club Hearts, um, they, they scouted me when I was about seven, as I said, and then obviously spent time at this training thing at Stepford, and then moved through the academy when I was about eight. I think I was eight to play under ten, so that's right. Yeah, so. so, how did the pathway to Queens Park come about? I was at Hearts for three years. Um, I was about 11, turning 12, I think. And then I left there. Um, I went to Rangers for a bit on trial. I was there for like 10 months. And while I was at Rangers, they, they, they kind of wanted me there, but then they want me there at the same time. So they, they kept me there training. And then they were saying, it was kind of like a loan deal. I was basically at Rangers training. And then to get games, I went and they sent me to play for Queen's Park. So I trained at Queen's Park one night a week. And then played with them at the weekend so it was good because I was getting a, a mix of both I mean I was still involved at the, in the Rangers Academy and then got to Queen's Park but eventually the, the Rangers thing just ran out um, and then I just went to Queen's Park for there because I really enjoyed it when I was there and kind of just made you love football I mean some of the academies are a bit intense and they can get in top of kids and I felt I think that I worked better in a more relaxed environment and I think that was what Queen's Park suited me and I just went there and and that's where I probably flourish. I think looking at Queen's Park, I mean, I know they are a, a third division Scottish club on paper, but you know, it produces player after player. Obviously, it's, it used to be my local club until I, I sort of moved down and I've seen countless players come through, even if you go back as far as the likes of like Neil Collins. Fair enough, you look at Andy Robertson and stuff like that, but they've always produced people. And um, What's the setup like at Queen's Park and what is it like when you're coming through? They've probably developed a lot as, as we were there. I mean, the one they looked upon is being one of the, the bigger clubs, obviously they had amateur status with the, like, the first team, so they kinda, I think they got overlooked a wee bit, but I feel like they probably, like the teams we had, myself, Andy, as we play in, it was like three, four years where we really started competing with like, Rangers and Celtic and that, and we were playing them quite a lot, and and then the, the academy got the status that they were like pro-youth, as they call it, and they lifted their status that way, so I feel that we, we had a part to play in that, and I mean, there was a, there was a few teams and we were, they were good sides or different age groups and managed to get the, the youth set up into the into the top top division, as they called it. It wasn't a competitive league or that, but it was um, obviously playing the, the bigger academies. And that was when I first went, it wasn't a league gap, but a few years down the line, it, it was in a good place. You know what I mean? Who was it who was like looking after you then as you were coming through? Because I know you made your debut quite young. I know it was, I think, 17 when you made your debut. But when you were sort of coming through and then maybe that... Um, low, like loan move stage, as you were saying before, from from Rangers. Who was the academy coach at Queens Park, or did you get a train with the first team and stuff? No, it was I was only I was only thirteen when I went, so I had had loads of coaches. And I mean, I played thirteens, fourteens, fifteens, and then one year at seventeens. So I was sixteen, and then at the end of that season, I ended up all that time I was playing for the reserves. I played for the reserves when I was about fifteen, and the reserve coach. Uh, Bill Coe, he took me in and played me with the reserves quite a lot so I was getting that kind of it was close to first team experience playing against guys yeah. and that because it was quite a competitive league the reserve league at the time and I think it was I, that was when I was about 15 and then when I was 16 the last game of the season I got my debut for the first team so that was obviously great for me and then the following season that's when I went and joined up with the first team Because as you were saying before about your, I think you made your debut in 2011, 2012 uh, and been right, eh? something like that. But it was really sort of 2012, 13, I think, where 
you really sort of blossomed at Queen's Park as well. But before I go into that, uh, is it true that at Queen's Park they set the young lads up with like a part-time job so they can help you earn a wage and stuff, like they look after you away from football as well? Is that true? They do. I they, they, they know a lot of context. I mean, I was when I was sixteen, I was still at school. I mean, I just I was just kind of leaving. I left school in between making my debut and then joining up the following season with the first team. So um, that was when I they, they got me a job as well. I worked in a factory over at Harrington, the McAlpine plumbing factory. They got me in there. They they did contacts and I went in and, and done a bit of tool setting in there. So that was it was a good experience for me. So I think it's quite good that like a club who, let's be honest, that any of their profit or input or anything that they can do tends to have to be football based because of the size of the club, I suppose. But the fact that like they're looking after the young lads as humans in the same way that maybe a Scottish Premiership club was, do you think that says a lot for Queen's Park and the, the setup that you came up in? It does. I, it's, it was always it was always a great place to be. You know what I mean? It was a real, real friendly, family oriented club. Like. It just felt like a big family right through all the age groups and everybody knew each other and everybody did everything they could to help each other and they've been successful, you know what I mean? Because it was just a really good good environment to be a part of and all the coaches, they were just, they, they never got a wage of that coming through the youth. They were all just volunteers and they were giving up their time two or three nights a week to come and, to come and coaches, you know what I mean? And I think obviously as a young boy, you, you don't realise how much you appreciate it until you get to this age and you see what the guys were doing for you. So I think that was probably the the best thing about it was just everybody was, was doing their bit to try and make it better and I feel that the club they do everything they can to, to help people as much as they can for, for being a probably quite a small club you know what I mean there's no disrespect in saying that they are oh, absolutely. all divisions quite a small club so um, as I said they, they do all they can to help everybody Like I was saying before you got into the side about 2012 you ended the season I think as top scorer as well at the age of what, 17 but when you look at the squad like I was just looking at day, and obviously there's names that stick out, but it's actually full of players that made it towards either the Scottish Premiership or even maybe the, the you know, the English Premiership as well. There was yourself, Paul McGinn, who's at Hibs at the moment, Blair Spittle, who I think is at uh, Ross County at the moment. You've got Aidan Connolly, who's currently at Falkirk, and of course you've probably got the best left back in the world at the minute, in Andy Robertson. But what was Robbo like growing up as a young lad at Queens Park? Because I'm guessing he had talent, but you don't necessarily know you're going to be playing with the best left back in the world at that time, do you? No, that's it. I need to with a with a picture. There's it's a bit of a dream story, you know what I mean? Like he's went on and done, and he was just he was a normal lad. I mean, he was a good player, and as I said, we 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 had teams and everybody done their bit. That was what we were all about. And obviously, when we got to the first team, it was it was different. He played every I think he played every minute of every game that that season and. And he really kicked on and obviously moved on to United. I would, I would, I'm not going to lie and sit here and say I'd, I'd see him going playing for Liverpool in the Champions League. You could, you could never imagine that for anybody at that age. You know what I mean? But he was always, he was always a good lad, and he obviously got his set back with getting released for Celtic, and then came and joined up with us as well. So uh, it's just great to see you've, you've played with somebody that's been on to do that as well. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I, didn't, I don't think it's any disrespect saying you can expect someone to go on such a trajectory. It's actually a compliment to him, isn't it? To see him go from there to where he's at now. You know, when you're playing at a team like Queen's Park, can you almost tell at that level which players are going to make it to at least like a higher level club or make a wage out of the game, shall we say? Right, it's made a really good side, to be fair. We've done quite well that season because we did have yeah. with quite a lot of young boys in, in the squad as well. And, but there was a lot of good players there, like, Obviously, Tony Quinn was there. He's like a club legend. He'd been there for years. Jamie Longworth was a good player. Davy Anderson, like Ricky Little, who a bro. There was loads. You know what I mean, I'm, I'm probably missing a few there, but there, there was a lot of good players in our team. And we, we probably just lacked a wee bit of experience at the end yeah. of the season. We got the playoffs, didn't, didn't all get promoted because <coughs> we ended up playing Peter Head and I think it's three one or four one. They beat us in aggregate, but. I feel like maybe if it had just if it had been the next year and we'd all played for a year and then joined up, it might have been different. But there was there was a lot of good players in our squad. But you can you can kind of gauge obviously people. Some of the guys there were were later on in their their age in their twenties towards their thirties and they're quite happy with their job and you know I mean they're working playing part time. But you can you can see the boys who are obviously hungry to go and kick on. We're all young and want to go and kick on and have a proper career in the game. And as you said, you know, there's a lot of players that were in that squad that were young lads that did end up getting moves and obviously had more experience actually away from Queen's Park. As it was, it was a great first season for you at Hamden. But like many of the squads, there was moves that were earned to what was the SPL at the time. Uh, you yourself moved to Aberdeen, but how much interest in you was there at the time and what made you choose Aberdeen? There was a bit, um, 
I think at the Christmas time of the season, Motherwell would have a sniff and I just didn't feel that I was ready to go. I wanted to try and play the season. So eventually, I think the United were maybe interested as well and, and then Aberdeen came in and I just kind of spoke to, to Derek McInnes at the time and I just felt that that was the right place for me to go. Pick the, the place two and a half hours away from my house right enough to travel. <laughs> <laughs> That's um, what I was kind of thinking, to be fair, because to anyone who just hasn't lived in Scotland, Glasgow to Aberdeen is longer than you expect, <laughs> isn't it? It's a decent trek, mate. You know, but um, I was just, it must have just felt right at the time. I mean, I can't really put my finger on exactly where it was, but you speak to people and you just go, yeah, go, yeah, got insect thing, and that's probably what I've done. Yeah, and it's a hugely famous club as well. I mean, that's been hugely successful throughout history with Scottish football. How much of a pull was Derek McInnes? It was, I. I um, also spoke to him in that and he'd just left Bristol at the time. Yeah. I think he'd been watching me with that, so he was keeping an eye on me and then obviously he went to Aberdeen and decided he wanted to see me there as well. So I kind of had an idea that he did like me, you know what I mean, as a player and that was probably a, a key factor in going there. Does that quite help them when you know someone's been watching you for quite a while as opposed to just like going in in the summertime? I can I, but at that time it did for me. No, I wouldn't really, really bother. Somebody watched me for two games and they were saying you then fair enough. <laughs> I mean, it's but at that time for me as a, a young boy, I felt it was maybe something that probably gave me a bit more comfort. Not I mean knowing that yeah. the dream was up there, so that was probably part of the decision. When we're talking about um, you moved to Aberdeen, was the plan always to go straight on loan? Because obviously you went to Dunfermline. I think you were in the League One at the time. I think, but you went there for a season, didn't you? Uh, six months. I, I just went up to Aberdeen and I played the first six months with the twenties, and then I think they realised I could probably go and play a bit of first team football. I mean, it was maybe wasn't it great for me to be playing there, so I went out and played at Dunfermline. I think played fourteen games or something. And I scored yeah. about some goals, so that was decent. And that was in League One as well, so I was a step up for the league I played before. So I done quite well there, and then. I got injured just towards the end of the season and then Firman ended up losing in the playoffs but I picked up an injury so that, that kind of brought that to an early end and I just went back up to Aberdeen. How important was that loan move for your progression? It was good. Um, obviously, you get out and what we, it was Jim Jeffries, uh, yeah. Mike, and then John Potter, they were there at the time so it was a it was a new experience working with different people as well and that's something about my career I've really enjoyed working with different managers and coaches and styles and Obviously, Jim Jeffries is, is really old school and that was good for me at that age to go and experience that a proper... It was probably harsher than Danny McInnes would be at the time because I'd just came up in that, but um, Jim Jeffries was just right on right on the case and I thought that it, it needed sorted, they sorted and we had quite a young squad in the film as well. There's a lot of young boys there and he probably, he probably shaped up a good few boys to go and move for there as well, which they have. Did you say John Potter was there as well? Are we talking like the Hibs... Coach oh, yeah. and obviously formerly at Sunderland now obviously he was at Sunderland for 18 months and he seemed like a shall we say a passionate man he's, he's not quiet what was he like? Uh, he's, he's a great guy but it's um, really really funny he's just he's kind of made for that role as, as a number two you know what I mean in, in a, a club because he's a good middle man between players and, and coaches obviously but a really, just a really funny guy and dead easy to get on me so he made everybody even if you had a bad result, everybody was laughing again on the Monday morning and that. I mean, he, he lifted the spirits really well and it's it's kind of important to have guys like that around a football club. I would definitely want somebody there. If, if I was a manager, I'd want somebody like him to be about the squad. Yeah, hugely important. Um, as it was, you went back to Aberdeen the following season and you did manage to get into Derek McInnes' plans for the first team. I think you played sort of 17 games. What did McInnes say to you, his plans were for you when you came back? I was always just to go and obviously the feeling was to go and get a bit of experience and then I just came back. I was obviously injured at the end of that and then joined up pre season, trained pre season and he must have felt that they wanted me in his squad for, for the season going forward and at the time I think it was myself, Adam Rooney, David Goodwillie. They were all, we were the three strikers in the squad and he just kept us there. Obviously they two were vastly experienced, I mean, and I was just kinda there as as, as backup, so to say, probably. Um but it was it was a good season. Obviously, the, the club at the time were probably the, the second biggest team in in Scotland. Rangers were obviously doing the divisions, and they were the closest challengers to Celtic for two or three seasons, maybe at that time. So it was um, it was probably a tough one. There's, there wasn't as many opportunities as as you would like. And I mean, Adam Rooney probably had his best season 
that season he, he was banging goals in left, right and centre every, every time he scored for the reserves he, he was scoring man mail for the first team at the weekend so there was nothing really you could do you know what I mean you just had to, to applaud his form and, <laughs> and, and wait until the chance came but um, I made 17 appearances most of them off the bench I mean and had two starts in there as well but it never just never really worked out I had a couple of a good chances to score and there was one at Hamilton the goalie pulled off a wonder save he's called the ball for behind his head and, and I missed a sitter against Celtic for about six yards out for a header and I mean it was just kind of looking like this this might not <laughs> this might not work out here but it wasn't it wasn't feel like a try I mean it was it was just one of the things that never really materialised Yeah absolutely you were saying before about how good of a season Adam Rooney had and obviously the experience at the time as was David Goodwill he, you know to be, to be fair he played in the Premiership I think at, uh, with Blackburn and was just fresh from that uh, you touched on it as well you played really well in like I think what would have been the under 20s but in truth like you say you, you did sort of struggle that season to find the net in the Scottish Premiership as it was how hard is it for a striker especially at that young age to get your confidence back when you're going on that kind of run where you're missing a sitter you're getting one perfect and the goalkeeper's making a worldly save is it quite hard to get the confidence back and how do you go about it it's obviously it's tough at the time because you want you want the goals to go in. I mean that's, that's what you want as a striker. Obviously that's what that gives you confidence. And I feel that if one one with them maybe went in, it might have, it might have worked out different. It might have changed it. Not mean, but um, it was just it was just one of the one of the things that didn't that didn't seem to happen. And as I said, you never know if if one goes in and your luck changes a bit, then it might be all different. But that was near, wasn't it to be. What was Derek McInnes like during that period? Because obviously he was someone who brought you in as a young lad and as someone who's experienced, he's probably seen that situation a million times over where strikers come in and just unfortunately it hasn't worked for them. But I'm guessing because he brought you in, you were his sign and he still wanted it to work very much. So so what was he like for you during that period? No, it was fine. It wasn't, it wasn't it hard on me or that. It was just by the things. He was probably, he was probably the same, just told my man to go in because he knew, he probably knew he if if I go with it, it would probably be different. Know what I mean, but I it was just it was a weird one. It didn't didn't, didn't see it happen. Um, I'm confident myself. If if I if I did a goal with a with a went in, I'd have probably went on and, and scored a good few. Know what I mean, but it's it's life in it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, well. well <laughs> Without blowing smoke up your arse, mate, let's be honest, it's kind of worked out that you seem to know where the net is over the past few seasons, so something's something's gone right. <laughs> like you say, probably just one of them things. The thing was, I'd, obviously there was 17 appearances there on record, but some, some of them were, were honestly like five minutes here and a half. Like that, I remember one at Motherwell, I got put on and the guy took a throw in and flung it to the centre half and I chased it and the final whistle went. You know what I mean? So that could have been appearance as well. It wasn't all as bad as... Is, is what it's made it, but yeah, that's... and you're also young as well. What would you be 19, 18, 19? Uh, I 19, I think I'd have been 19. You're still learning your trade then at 19, aren't you? On the other side, we've we been owning, we've won the reserve league. I mean, the Aberdeen team, the reserve team, and they've done that in years, so it was going well there, but it was just in the, in the first team, it wasn't working out quite as good, but it happens. Yeah, it does, mate. It does. Um, as it was, you had the loan move to St Mirren the following season. I think it was Ian Murray that had brought you in. Was it Ian Murray at the time that brought you into the club? It was, eh? um, He was just... I don't know if he'd been a manager before that or that was his first spell, but I'm not too sure. But aye, it, was, it was him that brought me to one. Because he's, a, I think he's at Airdrie at the minute, is he? Or am I wrong with yes, that? I, yeah, Airdrie. I thought he's at Airdrie. Um, you actually enjoyed a, a really successful loan spell at Sinmar in the first season round, but I think Ian lost his job in the December, and you we were replaced by someone I'm lucky enough to call a friend and someone who I absolutely love, Alex Ray. What was he like as a manager, Alex? As you said, obviously Ian Murray was at the start, way and it just never really worked to it for one reason or another. Can he put my finger in that either? Just another one of the football things, but. We found ourselves kind of at the wrong end of the table and then Ali Ray came in and he was just, he was a different personality, you know what I mean? Ian Murray was quite a quiet, reserve guy and then Ali Ray's just totally out there and he, he kind of came in and I feel that like it's probably what we needed just to lift everybody, you know what I mean? Because when your results are gone bad and things aren't looking great, you need somebody just with a, a bit of enthusiasm and, and that energy just to, to lift the group and I feel that's what he did come in and do and I think we... We ended up going on a real good run of form for, for when he came in to the end of the season. We done quite well. We got ourselves up the table a wee bit and there was a couple of good like derby wins and that in there as well. So 
he just he just probably as I said gave us that lift at the time that, that we all needed and in his personality shone through the squad and that probably helped us getting the results. He was a great player as well. I mean, I was lucky enough to watch him as a, a player. Obviously, I don't have any experience with him as a manager, but what was his coaching style like? Because obviously, he's more known as a pundit these days. He was good. He was hands-on. He got involved in everything. And I quite liked that about him. Not mean he was involved in you know, the, the drills and that. He was making sure that everybody was, was up to scratch with the tempo and stuff. And it was just... It's hard. Football training isn't much different. I mean, people have their own wee drills at the day, and but the main state is just the same. It's passing, possession, games. Like, but it was just the way he coached it. Probably at the time was was what we needed more than the actual coaching. It was just his enthusiasm for the game and and getting everybody lifted. As I said, that that probably helped us the most as of the actual coaching on the pitch. I mean, with his uh, when he did get involved with the pitch, was he still quite handy? I was decent. Um, Good, we stay up, like on a Monday if you you played on the Saturday or whatever the next day after a Tuesday game you'd been for a recovery and used to love like a game at foot golf so you'd, you'd just set up a circuit around the training pits and you'd be around chipping balls around the back of goals and I'd be up around the corner flag and right around the training pits and that but he loved that and he was, he was good at it to be fair As it was he unfortunately lost his job, so it seemed to happen at the time with St. Mary, and I think it was going through, at the time, like a really difficult time, really. You come on loan again the second season because yeah, I think you'd scored about 10, 11 goals in about 16 or 20 games. So you'd had a really good start on your, your first season. The second season, for whatever reason, St. Mary just didn't seem to work as it was, and Alex Ray, was it, as it was, got sacked. Um, and in came Jack Ross, who changed an awful lot for St. Mary. What was your relationship like with Jack Ross? I'll touch on it after the first season I went back to Aberdeen and obviously I'd done quite well at St Martin and I, I joined up pre-season I had a good pre-season I was really fit in that and then I thought this will be, this will be my year you know what I mean I can get back and get involved and get a chance but the gaffer wanted to bring a boy in for doing south and there was a boy Wes Burns he was very Fleetwood I think at the time and yeah I remember Wes Burns yeah. and he came on he literally like he came in in the morning, he signed, and I'd been on the bench the first European game, I think, and then he signed in the afternoon, and then he went on the bench, and I was in the stand. I got left out, so I kind of knew then. But like, honestly, his number went up. He came on as a sub. He ran for the halfway line to the box and scored a header for the corner with first touch. And I was like, right, <laughs> my, my days are probably numbered here, you know what I mean? So that was when I went back out. But it, it, I didn't realise at the time, but my, my confidence probably took a hit then, you know what I mean? I'd, I built myself up that I thought I was going to be involved for that season and that probably gave me a wee, a wee dunt back down to, back down to earth and it was probably a bit much at the time. I, I don't know if I just got fed up with it or whatever. You know what I mean, I don't know what happened but I went to St Monday and I just, I wasn't, I wasn't the same player to be honest. I was probably nowhere near the, the form that I took the previous season whether that was confidence or just, I'm, I'm not sure I can tell you but I just wasn't the same. Um, so that was that, obviously. And then Jack Ross came in and he probably got me in my, probably my worst way in a form that he could have seen me in. I mean, I, I can't blame him. He probably look at me and think this this boy's not that good a player. I mean, that was that was the way I was at, at, at the time. And I played in a cup game and I scored two. I think and kind of looked up for there, but um, I just I probably wasn't there mentally and physically. I just wasn't wasn't totally couldn't put my finger on it why, but I just wasn't wasn't performing the way I should have been. And he decided that things had to change because he came in and we were probably, I think we were both in the league and th- things didn't need to change and they decided that, no, it was, a, it was kind of mutual because he said to me that he felt that he couldn't promise me the football when I was at a contract at Aberdeen at the end of the season. So right away you're thinking, right, I need to make sure I'm playing to try and get a contract after that. So I, I decided and it wasn't, a, when, no way did we fall out of that. You know what I mean, we had a good relationship with him. It was a, a good coach and I enjoyed the time there with him, a good manager and that, but I just decided it was it was time for me to, to try and move on and, and try and get some games before the end of the season was out and give myself the best chance of getting a move after that. With um, Jack Ross as it was, obviously he, as he said, they were bottom of the league and he, that turnaround that he, he put in was unbelievable really when you look at it and obviously earned him the job at Sunderland which is no disrespect to St Mirren fans in my opinion of course very biased a bigger club you obviously weren't part of that as it was even though it wasn't right for you at the time like at St Mirren under Jack Ross from what you've seen 
Jack Walsh was implementing or beginning to implement at St. Mirren, were you surprised at how quick the turnaround was or could you see that he was doing the right stuff for the club themselves? Uh, I wouldn't say I was surprised, no, because he's training, like everything he'd done, he's training and it was it was really, really good. And I mean, it was impressive because he was obviously a young manager and he'd, I think he came from Alloa. He was yeah. Alloa, he'd been really well there and then he came to St. Mirren and I was I was really impressed with him because there was a couple of Cammy Smith ended up going there on loan, and he he phoned me and he was like, "What's it like?" And I was like, "I've been staying there, and that's brilliant." To be fair, and I mean, it was really enjoyable, and I, I probably wish I'd just hung a bit now and, and got got myself a bit fitter. And I mean, at the time, it would, it would have probably been better for me to do that, but um, obviously I decided otherwise. But I wasn't I wasn't surprised that he, he went on and, and done so well with St. Mirren, and then obviously getting that move to to Sunderland was was great for him. I, I hear that he's he's really 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 thorough, and I think you see. I, can you can you tell that I once called for Jack Ross's head when I was a Sunderland fan? Because whenever I get anyone that's played under Jack Ross, I kind of feel like I I owe him something back because I think I was probably wrong with it. But I heard that he's really quite thorough. He's quite for a young manager. I think it sounds like he's one of those people you can tell is destined for somewhere that's a bit higher in the game. And I, I've always felt like that. I think like somewhere like Hibbs and probably even higher is where he's he's destined to be. And I don't think it's any surprise he's been linked to the Scotland job before. Ah, uh, yes, his his attention to detail is really good, and everything, just everything he does, he, he just seems to be really organised, and, and, and it's kind of natural for him to be a coach. I think you just you just get that feel about him. Know what I mean, but obviously, find yourself at Hibs now, who are a, a massive club in Scotland, and I think he, he probably turned him around a bit as well when they, when he came in there. He had to kind of do the same that he done at St Mirren. Um, obviously, next season will be different for him again, but. I'm not. I'm not surprised. Well, we played them in the cup. Obviously, they, they put us at the Scottish Cup after a replay. But these teams are always well drilled, and I just feel that they probably could, they probably could go on and, and manage again at higher level. But um, I'm sure they'll be, they'll be quite happy with Sibs team in that, and they'll be happy there because they're doing well. With uh, with Jack Ross, you talk about attention to detail. Does that it goes right down to his clothes, doesn't it? Because is he the best dressed manager that you've ever played under? No offense to Robbie Nielsen at all, like, because he's also quite a snappy dresser. But Jack Ross is next level, isn't he? No, they like to be fair because Robbie Nielsen makes a good effort, and all. he enjoys a, a suit and a blazer and a jumper. And Jack Ross is the same. He enjoyed a wee a wee zipper and a half zip. So <laughs> anyway, the, the, the managers are getting more and more trendy, and then he will not be McCall, who's just in his trackies thirty four seven. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I definitely, definitely can't criticise the, the dress sense of Jack Ross. That's one thing I could never criticise. <laughs> no, it makes a good effort. Um, as it was, you had a, a short spell at Greenock, but as you know, come the age of 21, you find yourself sort of released from Aberdeen, um, highly rated. Then you go to 21, you're released, you're looking for a new club. How scary is it for like a young professional to be told you let go at such a, a tender age, basically, when you, you're still kind of grown up, you're still a kid at 21? I could, to be honest, I kind of knew I was getting released. I mean, I knew I hadn't done well enough in the season. I went to Morton, um, worked under Jim Duffy, who was was brilliant with me. And I, I don't know why I never done. I probably should have done better than what I did. I mean, I scored a few goals, but I didn't. Again, I just didn't perform that year for some reason that season, and I probably should have because Jim Duffy gave me a lot of game time and and tried to install a lot of confidence into me and. Probably did in a way at times, but my head was just all over the place. I think I was probably too focused in the summer and worrying about getting released and instead of just concentrating on the football and trying to do something there. So, obviously, when the time comes and you're released, there's, there's nothing you can do. The worrying has not been any good for you. So, I think that was probably the thing that, that clicked for me. I mean, I've worried all this time and I'm still released anyway, so it doesn't, it doesn't really matter what I've worried about. But it's, it's not a nice position to be in, obviously, because when you're young, you you think your just career's just going to you sign Aberdeen, then it's just going to kick on and be perfect. But it's there's, there's plenty of bumps on the road, and that was obviously one of them for me. I read a story that when you were released, you actually went out and got your own balls. I think from like Sports Direct and practiced on your own in sort of the local park. Is that true? I did. I had to because I was I was obviously just in running to start with, and then. I go to the point where I was like, right, I'm going to touch a ball again in case I need to go and train. It was gone for that long. Like, so I ended up just, um, I had to go and buy, buy a few balls and take my wee cousins down the park and that and fire them in goals. <laughs> kidding, on, I was, kidding on, I was trying to hang about with them. I was using them a wee bit to, <laughs> to get some training. But um, I, I, I'll need to be thankful to them there, right enough. Do you feel like you were like looking into the future because lo and behold, three years later, you've got coronavirus and you've probably got all those balls stored up ready to go again? <laughs> 
I know they're that good in the road in Glasgow. I can have been doing that for the morning. Um, <laughs> um, lo and behold, and you know, little did anyone know it at the time, but I think that was really the moment where your career began to blossom and probably match what many people expected you to do sort of in the early days. Uh, you moved to, as it was at the time, League One was A United. Um, I don't think you were offered a contract till about September 2017. The way it wasn't like straight away, it was September, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. It was, um, we went, uh, when I, after I got released with Aberdeen, we went through that summer. Right through, I like, got released in May and then it was June, July, August, nothing. Went on trial with the United, I was two weeks here. Swansea for two weeks, Carlisle for three days. Like, I was just trials all the place. Waste of time, to be honest. <laughs> well, maybe not the Swansea one because Swansea one was just before I came to United, eh, signed for there, sorry. And I'm doing there on January 23s and I've done really well, to be honest. I've been in and, and I've done well running about the squad now and I was thinking, do you know what? I'm not that far off this, you know what I mean? Like, that level, he, 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 he 23 boys at that size of club, I was like, well, I joined in and I was I was doing well in training and I think that probably gave me a wee bit of confidence to come back up the road, although it didn't work out, I didn't get signed. I knew when I came back, I was ready for whatever club, if anybody would have took a chance on me, I was going to be ready for it and, and give it a right good go. So that was, it was probably good that way. With um, Ian McCall, I think, Obviously, did really, really well at Air, and I know things might have gone a bit sour since with him going to Park Crystal and stuff like that. But um, what is it that he did, and, and the club itself that I suppose, so to speak, give you your swagger back a little bit? You've touched on the confidence that Swansea give you there, but what is it that they did to add on to that to give you the confidence back to have such a phenomenal season that you did? When when I went to Morton uh, the season before, Air were interested in me as well, so. But they were like, I think they were bought me the league and Morton were currently in the playoff position. So I'd, I'd actually agreed to go there. I was going to there and then I was going to I was going to sign for them and Jim Duffy phoned me and then I was on my way to sign and Jim Duffy phoned me and I just did a change of heart. I don't know why. I don't know, <laughs> I don't know why, but I'm actually glad I did because it probably when I worked it the way it eventually did. Um, so right away I knew I, knew I owed... Ian McCall that way, you know what I mean? Because he'd found us in League One, and he, he was, I was lucky enough that he would let me go in and train. I think I trained for a day or two, and I was in, I was in good shape, and I was sharp. You know what I mean? I'd kept myself training really hard, and I knew I was taking this opportunity if it came. You know what I mean? So I went in, and I'd done well in training, and then he was like, "Right, I'll sign you." And then he flung me in right away against Rafe. Rafe away, it was. We ended up losing two one. I scored on my debut. I done alright because I hadn't played a game in months. I think I lasted about seventy minutes, but I done quite quite well. We lost the game, obviously, but um, I did do quite well get my goal on that. And I think further on in, I just realised this guy's going to give me a chance. You know what I mean, and when when you've got a manager that's, that's shown a bit of faith in you, it does help. You know what I mean, as a player, you you need, you need that, and that was obviously what I, what I really needed at that time. And he just he made me feel like a player again. I don't know what he done, but he just. He just let me go and play. It wasn't in, in specific. He just go and enjoy yourself, go and, go and play your football again. And he obviously knew I had the ability. He'd, he'd seen that before, obviously, trying to sign me. And he knew if he got the best at me, I would do well for him. And, and thankfully enough, that's the way it worked out. How important was Ian McCall to your career, do you think? I owe him for the, rest, for the rest of my career. I always owe him for, for what he done for me. And it wasn't just football wise, but we we got really close, you know what I mean, and it's it's strange to say that because as a manager, when you when you go to teams, your your manager's not really close to you, you know what I mean. But we at Air, it was it was different. He just he was close to other boys, not just me, but he just made me feel like a really good player again. And I don't I don't know what he done, as I said, but that that was it. And I, he just installed that belief in me again, and and I knew that if if I had that and. I knew I, would, I was getting back to the guy that he'd go and play every week and score goals for him and that just worked, worked wonders for me. It was like a relationship, you know, between the club and the player and the manager and all that comes with it. Sort of pretty much like you say from day one and he ended up having a phenomenal season. I think he ended up with 29 goals in 33 games. However, as it was, the league title was actually still quite tight between yourselves and, um, and Wraith Rovers as it was who you made your debut against. Um, 
football does like to kick in the ball sometimes, which I'm sure everyone is aware of. Um, and with games to go, you get sent off against Stranra, air lose, and suddenly the league title's in the balance. You're the top scorer. You're suspended for the remaining games. You watched on as air lose to Alawa, and it almost, at the time, kind of almost handed the title towards Wraith. But thankfully, you know, come the final game of the season, as I like to call it, Wraith bottled it, hit the post in the last minute, was air one. Um, but there's a video of you why the clubs are both waiting for the final whistle and it's kind of like the, the Aguero moment where you've got like Wraith in there and you see obviously Wraith hit the post but you see you as soon as the full-time whistle goes which is about 10 seconds before I think Wraith's final whistle goes you like run on the pitch and you, you're trying to find the score I think it was at Somerset Park as it was at the time yeah. and then you get the score but then you immediately see you sort of frantically flying towards the fans just ignoring everyone straight into the fans um, but that period of time I'm talking from like the Stranra game up until like the final game of the season how difficult is that watching from the stands? It was it was horrendous because like I said I caught the boy with an arm and it was just I appealed it and all that and I was like please just <laughs> put this appeal through you know what I mean because it wasn't it mom mom was up and I was like that and I mean I've never yeah. had him but it wasn't as if I'd flung my elbow to try and whack him you know what I mean but he went down holding his face and the ref obviously seen it different and the manager went and appealed it and he said there was no chance for the start so that was it it was just coming to deal with that and it was it was sickening you know what I mean because I knew how good a season I had and I'd played a good part in that season but then it was just over to in the boys to, to get the job done and we went to Alawa we got a penalty near the end and Moody's missed it another boy in Craig Moore had a brilliant season and I was like things had started to turn for the worst I mean you're just thinking but I was getting into the last game but every time somebody in that season had went top of the league they lost the next week and it was yeah. honestly as if, it was as if nobody wanted to win it it was just we were top they were top they were top and they were getting top in the last day and I don't know why but all week in training, we just, everybody, like, the boys, there was quite a lot of injuries, we had quite a lot of injuries at the time, myself, Paddy Boyle, I think Ross Dockett was injured as well, we made a few, and we just kind of tried to install belief in everybody, you know what I mean, that we could still do it, and turn it up on the day, I was just, I was, honestly, I, I don't know why, but I just knew in the back of my head, I was like, this is a lot of pressure for them to deal with, and Allo were a good side, you know what I mean, they were going for playoffs, and, Obviously, they drew us drew or beat us the week before. Now, they beat us, actually. They beat us, and I was like, hopefully they can, they can do us a favour, you know what I mean? Because they'll want a good bit of form getting out in the playoffs. So, it was just pure belief for everybody. We just had to go out and get our job done. And then, that feeling, they, they seen the, the score there had finished that each other. I don't think I'll, I'll ever experience it like that again. But, as you said, you kind of lose control of your emotions at that point, And they're just running about like a madman. But, um I loved every minute. It was brilliant. So, what was it like when you found out you like won the title? And then, did you realize that Wraith had hit the post in the last minute, or did you just see the score and think, right, fuck it, straight into the fans? <laughs> that was it. As soon as it came up, um, final whistle. But obviously, the crowd started cheering. Yeah. But um, the boys we were watching it on a, we had to watch it on. It was like a a betting app because it was like, oh yeah, 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 like the, the live thing or whatever. Yeah, I think, it was, I think it was Paddy Boyle's dad's phone. <laughs> we were watching it. <laughs> Something like that. Some, no, some new grand as well. I can't remember. We were watching it on. And then, obviously, it's like live. So, I mean, if it just came up, final whistle, man, it was brilliant. What a feeling, man. I, never, I can't explain it, but... <laughs> yeah. Just, if you get experience that in football, what a feeling it is. It's kind of why you, you get into it, isn't it? It's a, kind of is the moments you dream of, pretty much. And like you say, it's unexplainable as a fan. St. Manchester as a player, I can imagine. I mean, anyone who hasn't watched the video, anyone who's not an A United fan, I'd, I'd recommend them to watch the video. And I think the way that you leg it straight into that main stand kind of sums up exactly how you felt, doesn't it, without you having to say. Um, the club as it was, so they, they signed you on like a, a one-year contract that season. And, uh, you know, th this is kind of more of a question from my, my friend who's an A United fan. I think you said many expected you to sort of depart after such an outstanding season, but you unexpectedly signed a one-year extension to stay at Air United. Um, what other opportunities did you have, and, and you know what made you stay at Air rather than go elsewhere? Um, at the time, there wasn't there wasn't major offers. I mean, it was because obviously I'd found myself at a, at a team in Rice really Aberdeen, and then that was my first season back, so I'd just done well for that season. And I think I maybe had a couple, but there was nothing like. Nothing mad. There was, I think failed to do south. 
Yeah. They'd signed there for the year, put a bid in and that after we played them in a friendly, but there was nothing major and I knew that that I was enjoying my football. That was the most important thing. I was back enjoying it. Ed had offered me another year's contract. I loved the club. I loved the manager. The changing room was brilliant. So at that time, I just felt, you know what, I'm enjoying myself now. I'm just going to hang about and, and give this championship a go because people obviously had question marks whether I could do it at, at that level. So I could have played for there in the championship before and it never worked out. So I just felt at that time it was it was right for me to hang about and, and I'm glad I did. Is there a part of you that also felt like you owed the club as well because they're taking you from what was quite probably a low ebb at the time to like turning you into one of the most talked about names in Scottish football and I mean let's be honest since then you've never really looked back but was there a part of you that felt like you like owed air as well like an extra year at least? There's a part of me that did but um, the manager phoned me after the first season and then after the league one season and he said to I met him actually I met up with him and he just said he said don't feel like you owe me or you owe the club it and he said Dave it's, it's right for you you know what I mean and saying that probably made me back to sign even more you know what I mean the way he approached Reverse it psychology. that was the way he, he, he put it across I mean he, he knew that moved to, to bigger clubs or whatever seen as bigger clubs but he also felt that it would be good for me to play for a year of fan in the championship so it just I think you just go with your gut instinct at the time what you feel is right and again I hung about and, and I'm glad I did as it was, you had another phenomenal season. Like we just touched, you've, you've kind of never looked back since that season when you signed for air. Um, come the end of the season, though, I think the contract did come to an end. It was rumoured that there was a, a whole host of clubs that were chasing you before you moved to Dundee United. And as we've already touched on before, I'm obviously a big Sunderland fan. And as I said, you're off air. I was actually quite desperate for you to sign. I think a lot of people were as well for desperate for you to move to the stadium. Light. And obviously, there was rumours that that came close. But did that ever come close to move to Sunderland? I think I think they maybe watched me a few times, but there was it was more people putting two and two together because I'd worked with Jack Ross before. I think as soon as somebody rumoured it, they must have thought, "Oh, there's something in that," and it gave me a bigger story than what it actually was. I mean, there was I think they they, they watched me as I said, and but there wasn't a there wasn't an official offer of that made or anything to me that they actually turned down or, or, or agree. You know what I mean? There was nothing. It didn't go that far, so. If they were interested, I didn't really hear about it. <laughs> I was going to say, because there was rumours at the time that you were you were at the training ground and people had seen you and stuff like that. I'm guessing you never had a chance to meet with uh, Jack Ross and as we, you might know them now, the Netflix crew of uh, Charlie Methven and whatnot. Well, I thought, no. There's a, obviously a few Scottish connections at Sunderland. Do you know any of the Scottish boys at Sunderland? Were any of them trying to sway you to come even just based on the rumours or are you not friends with any of them? It wasn't even, it wasn't like that. It wasn't as if they were yeah. actually anybody at the club had mentioned it at all I don't think there was nothing there was nothing in it at all it just the only thing in it was I'd worked with Jack Ross before and he was a manager at the time I think that was it that was a connection somebody had obviously made but there was there was nothing in it didn't come close to that yeah and you know we can't be denied Dundee United are obviously a massive club and obviously actually no disrespect to them whatsoever this is literally me being biased as a Sunderland fan but say you know Dundee United didn't happen would Sunderland have been a, a a move that would have interested you at the time would you have felt like moving south or did you quite do you quite like staying in Scotland at the moment where you are in your career Sunderland are obviously a massive club I mean that goes without saying <laughs> everybody knows about them and I think everybody's watched the, the Netflix and stuff and you know how big a club they are but hypothetically speaking it's, it's hard to to say that I mean but if Sunderland come here don't ask say they're interested in you you would obviously speak to them I mean it's it's hard to say it if it doesn't actually happen. I mean, it's, yeah. it's weird position to be in as a footballer talking about somebody being interested in you when they know. But I, if if they would have came calling, you obviously would have. But but they never, and, and they weren't they any. So it wasn't even in, in be a source in it. When it comes I'm to, to I'm not disappointed in doing any news here, but that was that's the <laughs> no, I do only. <laughs> but, only disappointing myself and our recruitment teammates. So don't worry about that. Um, like I said before, though, can't be denied. Dundee United are an absolutely massive club in Scotland. Um, loads and loads and loads of history, but I'm sure they weren't the only club that were interested in you at the time. Um, and there may have been other offers made, maybe higher up the pyramid in the Scottish Premiership. Obviously, you're there now, but at the time, you actually stayed in the Championship. So what made you choose Dundee United and Robbie Nielsen? What made you think that that was the right move, maybe then somewhere higher up the pyramid? Um, it was, obviously you hear whispers through your agent and stuff for teams that are maybe interested yeah. here but as soon as the United were interested um, Robbie Nielsen obviously the gaffer wanted, he wanted to meet me and he came to see me and we met up at my agent's house and he just sat down and spoke to me 
what he'd planned for me, what they'd planned for the club and and I felt I liked that, not mean that he took the time out to come and to come and actually see you, whereas today in it over a phone and you know, it's like you don't know what you're getting over a phone, he came and sat face to face with me and I really respected that and I mean and when he spoke through everything that he had planned for myself and for the club and his plans obviously for the future of the club and ideally promotion this season is what we spoke about and thankful for enough it's all materialised that way. But at the time I felt it was just it was right for me, it suited me, it was everything about it was positive. I, I couldn't really find a negative, although it was going to be another season in the Championship. I felt deep down that going to this club and if I'd done as well as I'd done for her, that I'd be playing my part in a team that's going to get promotion. I didn't see her any other way about it. I felt that we had a good enough team to get promoted and that was something I, I wanted to be a part of. And thankfully enough, as I said, it, it has worked out that way. Yeah, I was going to say, it's fair to say you made the right decision because it's worked out exactly as you, you would have planned, I would imagine. Um, as it was, I think, you know, your form over the past year was finally rewarded with a long-awaited call that I think many people have been calling for to the Scotland squad, alongside another one of the guests that we had on the show the other week, Declan Gallagher. But what goes through your mind when it's um, confirmed that you're, you're in the squad? Do you, like, ring your whole family? Do you have, like, a moment to just, like, give it a minute and then ring everyone? Or? It's, it's a mad feeling. I mean, it's... Certainly, you, you always do me to be involved in an international setup at some point. And being at Ed in that, um, when I'd done well in the Championship, Ian McCall was always saying to me, like, Andy, you will get in a Scotland squad, so keep believing it. And he's like, I feel you should be in it the new, but you're not going to get that at air and that. But he made a joke yet in the press and that, like, when we did interviews and stuff. But he always told me on the side, he's like, he's like you're good enough to, to go and play at that level. So, so always believe it. And I felt like I did. And part of the the conversation I had with Robbie Nielsen was being an international eventually. Maybe maybe it would have been ne- next season if we were in the Premier League or whatever. And, um, my progression went well with my career, then I might have got a chance. But thankfully enough, I, I done really well at the start of the season and started it off really well. And um, Steve Clark, also the manager, thought that it would be good to, to get me involved in the squad. And obviously, you make your, your debut for your country as I feel in another one, you'll, you'll never probably never get again and probably a moment when I was pretty surreal I was like wow I've, although the result never worked out I was like wow I've played for Scotland I mean it's it's something they can, can never take away from you So something about like seeing the name on the back of your shirt because obviously as I know that the name's on the back of the shirt you don't just go by numbers what's it like though when you like walk in the dressing room because it was Russia wasn't it your debut? Aye uh, Russia uh, came on as a sub and you see that shirt with like Shankland on the back your name and your number is that like a surreal moment how do you how do you concentrate on the game when you first see that and just go whoa so obviously like the, the stadium we played in in Russia was the, the Lesniki Stadium so that was where the World Cup final and that was like just the last one so even turning up to there the night before you're, you're walking into the pitch and you're like wow what, what a stadium this is you know what I mean and then I go to we also go to the changing room and it's a proper setup. You know what I mean it's no some of the changing rooms you get in the championship but it's no like that you know what I mean it's a big Massive stadium, big changing room through warm up area and all that. So it was it was amazing to even be a party and then you walk in and you see a strip and I had a strip when I was a kid and I think it was the only strip I ever got Shanklin on was my I had two Scotland kits when I was younger. And I think they were the only two I ever got my second name on for some reason. But it was pretty surreal walking in and obviously seeing a first team tote hanging up there and it was Obviously, just good to be there to start with, but when you go out and you warm up and the stadium fills up and you see how many people are there and all that, and you're like, I did start to think what a place this would be to make your debut, you know what I mean? Like, it'd be great to play here, but realistically, I didn't know if I was going to be anywhere near it. I didn't know what the what the chances were for me, you know what I mean? But thankfully enough, um, well, no, thankfully enough, well, obviously, Ollie got injured at half time, which isn't ideal, but um, he called upon me to be his replacement at, at the half time. When you first got in the squad and the training ground and stuff like that, does it feel a bit full circle when you see the likes of like Andy Robertson, who you played with when you were like seventeen? Yeah, there's there's probably points in your career. I mean, you, you you're gonna get and you'll be like, then I think this is gonna happen to me. And that was probably why. I mean, you're getting in and you're obviously training with like Premier League standard players down south and that. And but I, I didn't I didn't feel like a place. I mean, it was weird. To, like I felt nervous about things before. I was obviously a wee bit nervous getting into the first day of training, but. As soon as the first day I was there and I was just playing away, I, I, it just kind of went away. It felt it felt like the norm, weirdly enough. I don't know why, but it did. You know what I mean? And I think that was probably part of me that helped me enjoy it even more. And you were rooming with Deck, weren't you? Is that right? Yeah, I had a big Deck, yeah. Were you disappointed? 
I'd never, I'd never met him. I'd played against him at, um, when he was at Livingston. I was yeah. at St. the time and I'd scored a few goals there against him, I think. So, um, but that was obviously the first time I met him personally. But um, that's another good thing. I mean, you get to, you get to meet new people and Dick's obviously a great guy and then yeah. a good roommate, to be fair. So it's all right. Yeah, he's a very good lad. Very good lad, if I do say so myself. Um, I actually watched your full home debut and I remember you came close like a million and one times and I was desperate for you to score because I'd been calling for you to sign for something for years. So I'm thinking, please score against San Marino so it doesn't look like <laughs> I'm no. daft. But like, you did seem really desperate to score, and as it was, you got one. Like, were you absolutely desperate to get that goal that night? I was, I was more desperate to play well. Obviously, I wanted to score deep down, but I just, I wanted to play well. I didn't want to, to, to have a night well. I mean, I was, it was obviously quite tough conditions that night, but I think my all round game, I did day all right. I mean, that was, that was the main thing for me. I knew if I didn't score, I didn't score. You're not going to score every game, of course, as a striker, you want to, but. My main priority was playing well and, and doing well for the team. And then, as you said, I had a couple of chances. The goalie made a wonder save right at the start. And, um, and then I had a header, a header that half my own player. And I was starting to think <laughs> this could be one of these nights here. But I knew I just kept plugging away. There was going to be chances coming because that was the type of game it was. We were on the front foot for the vast majority of it. And, you know, when you're playing with that level of players, there's, there's going to be service coming. Funnily enough, it came for a shot that came off the bar, that was how I got my goal, but um, I, I was just, everything went slow motion as soon as the ball bounced off the bar and I controlled it with my right foot, everything just kind of seemed to slow down and I was having a glance at the linesman, I was like, keep that flagged in because I don't know if I was offside there, <laughs> but um, I can't clear enough, he, he kept it down, but that was obviously a great feeling um, to score your first goal, but it was me looking up and when you're day school and you can see your family, you know what I mean, how much it, it meant to your aim. It was it was probably that that, that that made me feel the happiest. I mean to see how happy people were to, to see me score. I suppose final question. It's the same question I asked uh, Deck as well, and he answered it superbly well, so no pressure. But are we going to qualify or what? I hope so. Um we've obviously got a tough tie in Israel, you know what I mean? We've, we've we were getting sent in the lead up to the to the squad being announced all the players who had been involved in the squad were getting wee clips in and you were getting getting to see what they were all about they're obviously a good side I mean we're good players but we know that we've, we've got good players as well I mean there's a lot of the, these players playing in the, the Barclays Premier League and at a really high level and we have got a lot of talent in the squad so if we can we can keep everybody fit this has probably helped we've got, probably got a few players back that we might not have had for the game so if we can Keep everybody fit and everybody's well when we're going to the games with, with a strong squad. Whether who's selected and not really bothered who's selected. If you're there, you, you know it's one of the things. But just hope whoever whoever is selected is is enough to, to go there and get a result. And then obviously you're going to face an, another tough challenge in, in Norway or Serbia. But you just need to believe. That's the thing. If you've got a bit of belief about the squad, we know the players have got the ability. And fingers crossed, everything can go well with a bit of luck. You can get, you can get through absolutely mate um, well Mr Shanklin thank you very much for your time I wish you luck uh, at Dundee United next season when we finally get to go on the pitch and go outside and do things <laughs> and obviously in the forthcoming Euros which I'm 100% certain you'll qualify for that's all a pleasure cheers mate Shanklin,